Tonight, travel ban loopholes. Students caught up in the coronavirus crisis allowed back into Australia as more cases are confirmed. Exclusive video, the moments leading up to Victoria's deadly train derailment and new details on the shocking speed it was travelling. An elderly woman escapes just in time as her Eastwood home is engulfed in flames. Police hunt a hit-and-run driver after a father is tragically killed on his morning walk. Helping hand the new push to buy local to get bushfire-ravaged towns back on track. And a stunning hat-trick helps Australia to a crushing win over South Africa in this series opener. This is 7 News with Angela Cox. Good evening. Hundreds of school students stuck in China because of the coronavirus will be allowed back into the country. The federal government has announced it will relax the strict travel bans. It comes as more infected Australians from the Diamond Princess cruise ship are flown home. Met on the tarmac by a waiting ambulance, the latest confirmed coronavirus cases on Australian soil. Six have now tested positive from the Diamond Princess cruise ship taken for hospital treatment in their home states. All are uh, well and in a stable condition. Three weeks since the travel bans were introduced, changes to allow close to 800 high school students stuck in China to return home. We are confident that if we allow in a small number of additional people from mainland China, that's not going to pose any material increase in risk to the population. Across the world, close to 80,000 have now been infected. In Ukraine, fear and panic. Protest is attacking busloads of citizens under quarantine. While in South Korea, hundreds are now contaminated from a secretive church group. And in the Philippines, they got married in masks. Well, the rate of new infections has reportedly slowed in China. The spread to other countries has spiked, especially around Europe and the Middle East. Health authorities warn time is now running out to avert a global pandemic. Some good news, though, from researchers at the University of Queensland with a breakthrough in a possible coronavirus vaccine. But public access, they admit, is still some way off. What we're aiming for is somewhere between 12 and 18 months. Cameron Price, 7 News. The Sydney XPT, which crashed in Victoria, was reportedly travelling 100 kilometres an hour. That's almost seven times faster than what it should have been doing. But experts say it wasn't the driver's fault, claiming warnings about the slow track weren't passed on. 7.46 Thursday night, the Sydney to Melbourne XPT captured on CCTV around six kilometres before the fatal crash. Minutes later, it was hurled from the tracks. The crash killing the driver, 54-year-old John Kennedy and the 49-year-old pilot. The train was one and a half kilometres north of Wallen Station when it derailed. On approach to a maintenance area, the driver should have received a signal to slow down to 15 kilometres per hour. Instead, the XPT ploughed into the passing loop at high speed, sending it off the rails. Our organisation is absolutely certain that the driver and his pilot did not receive the critical message. Today, the task of clearing the wreckage started. Machines move trees, creating paths for trucks that will haul out the carriages. There's still a long process ahead before the line can open. Once investigators are finished with the scene, it will be handed to the Australian Rail Track Corporation. They maintain this section of the line and it will be their responsibility to repair the damage before it's back up and running. The lead investigators have now finished most of their on-site evidence collecting. The train has also been released to the operator, but is heading for the scrapyard, the XPT beyond repair. In Wallen, Miley Hogan, 7 News. Live to 7's Louisa Cheatley at Wallen. Louisa, do we know when the track will reopen? Land authorities have told me it will take at least four days, but it's likely to be even longer than that. The ACTR is in charge of this track. They'll be the ones to ultimately make the decision about when it reopens, but V-Line and Sydney trains will also inspect the track to ensure that it's safe, but for those 153 passenger, passengers that were on the derailed train, many of whom have said to me that they'll never board a train again. Ange. OK, Louisa, thanks so much. 
Two people have died in a horror car crash near Grafton. The French tourists were travelling on Summerland Way just before four o'clock this morning when their hire car collided with a truck. They died on impact. Investigators are examining the crash site. The driver has been taken to hospital for mandatory testing. An elderly Sydney woman is lucky to be alive after fire engulfed her home while her husband was out. Home alone and watching flames in the roof spread quickly, she realised she had to get out. Flames erupt from the roof of the Hockley Road home just after 7am. A terrifying wake-up call for residents. My next door neighbour's house is currently on fire. This is what we've... Working up to. This woman's husband wasn't home, but she managed to escape before firefighters arrived. Yahya Ramsey was working next door when he saw flames and tried to help. We had a hose, a small hose uh, from the tap. We tried to help out. The lady, the lady was coming out from the home and uh, crying and saying help. But with the home totally consumed, a garden hose was no match and the property was destroyed. Well, the state of the house, it's... Uh... I'd say it's unlivable, definitely, and uh, the poor residents won't be able to return to it. It's believed an electrical fault in the roof caused the blaze. The lady, on uh, hearing noises in the roof space, realised there was a problem and there was fire starting to come down, so she evacuated the house. Firefighters say smoke was building in the residence roof for some time before she even noticed and that she was lucky to escape her burning home completely unscathed. It's fortunate that she was up at the time and not still asleep in bed and did hear the noises in the roof which alerted her to the fire. Very lucky, very lucky. Tom Saker, 7 News. Police are searching for a driver who hit a man out on his morning walk on the northern beaches. The victim was badly hurt but still breathing when the car drove off before later dying in hospital. His family has told 7 News they are devastated and want answers. Tony Platty was just doing what he did every day, an early morning walk to South Curl Curl. Usually he'd be home by nine to help his 103-year-old mother out of bed, but that's something he'll never do again. We looked out the window and we could see you know, a man lying in the road, so we rushed out with some blankets. It was clearly raining and umbrellas to see what we could do to help. He was clearly badly injured. The father of one is believed to have been hit by a car on Oliver Street about 5.30 this morning. The driver didn't stop to help. There's a good chance we'll identify them because we do have some footage and I think it's a lot easier for them and for family of the dead man if they come forward. After Mr Platty failed to return home and after seeing media reports, his distraught family rushed to the scene. Their worst fears were confirmed. Residents have told police that they heard two people arguing in the early hours of this morning around the time of the accident. A heated exchange about whether they should stay or go. But given it was dark and it was raining at the time and the man was wearing dark clothing, there's a good chance if it was a hit and run, the driver was unaware. Tonight, the person responsible for Mr Platty's death remains on the run. Laura Banks, 7 News. Labor frontbenchers insist coal mining jobs will be protected under their ambitious climate change goal. They're pushing ahead with a pledge for Australia to be carbon neutral by 2050, encouraged by climate protesters crowding the streets of Sydney today. Demanding greater action on climate change. Protesters in Sydney and Melbourne make their voices heard. Keep on making noise until something happens. And Labor says it's listening. I'm confident we can win the argument. Pledging to pursue net zero emissions by 2050 under leader Anthony Albanese. Showing that he's prepared to make tough decisions in the national interest. And bracing for a government scare campaign. He can't tell you what it costs. He can't tell you what industries will be affected. The opposition promising a detailed policy before the next election that won't sacrifice jobs. Reduces emissions in the atmosphere without doing any harm to our economy or to jobs in the coal mining sector. The right faction on side. Labor's Joel Fitzgibbon was agitating to back the coalition's target for 2030, but now... I don't think there is any rush to determine the pathway there. The mining lobby too under pressure over climate action, trying to enhance its image, sensing a change in public sentiment. The bushfires have caused you know, a lot of grief 
for many Australians. Rolling out a new ad campaign from tomorrow, spruiking the benefits of mining. It's great to know that Australian gold will help us fight cancer. As the fight over climate change continues. Olivia Leeming, 7 News. Shocking new figures show hundreds of Sydney daycare centres have been shut down and hardly any new centres are opening. Authorities have found operators were abusing the system and its parents who are paying the price. Daycares raided with arrest after arrest. They're the nightmare centres which were supposed to be caring for our children. But it's quite scary, but you don't know until you try. We've known it's been going on for a while. Sector-wide, we're disgusted. And the number of shonky centres will shock you. 211 family daycare centres have been shut since 2015, with 4,000 educators banned. A crackdown saw only three new daycare centres approved last year, 50 times fewer than in 2015. We make no apologies for cracking down on the rogue operators, but it's important that parents know that they're sending their children to a safe environment. The opposition says it's the government's own mess. They are the ones that provided licences to family daycare providers who, it turns out, are incompetent, unsafe. Regulators are watching. In the past 12 months alone, they've made more than 1,300 random visits to family daycare centres, ensuring they're operating within the law. It's hard to work out if they're well-meaning operators who are just getting something wrong. Parents know what they're looking for. Uh, reputation and yeah. the quality. And then when and we inspect the quality of care, the, um, the educators that are there. Serena Andaloro, 7 News. The Sydney housing market is tough to crack for any first home buyer and even harder for singles. But the new 5% deposit scheme is helping change that. And it's in our west that homes are being snapped up. Singles stepping into the property market undeterred by surging prices. Only six weeks into the government's first home loan deposit scheme, 65% of places have been secured more than half to single first home buyers. The 5% deposit scheme has been incredibly popular across Australia. Uh, it's a great scheme. It does allow people to get into the market a lot quicker. Houses making up 70% of certificates issued and in Sydney, it's our west that's booming. Schofield, Kellyville and Blacktown among the top suburbs for first home buyers last month. But for some wanting a unit, they bought a little closer to the city, including at Ryde and Randwick. The new house and land sector is seeing an enormous boost from first home buyers, so that's really good news for our construction sector. The scheme was meant to last until the end of the financial year, but now that's looking unlikely. As new research today reveals time poor Aussies believe the home loan application process needs to catch up to the digital age. Well, with three million Aussies planning to buy their first home in the next five years, eight out of ten said they're finding it hard to find their perfect home. Another piece of the property puzzle to conquer. Georgia Holland, 7 News. Department store giant David Jones is looking to shut up shop in the suburbs and instead focus on its city stores. Sydney's flagship Elizabeth Street shop accounts for 15% of total sales. Parramatta was also named as one of the top performers. That's likely to remain open. Poor retail figures elsewhere have prompted the decision, which the company says will allow them to focus on a luxury shopping experience. They'll look at what's profitable. They may reduce some of their stores in either size or they may close stores completely. Um, and that's a very logical move. Right now, the group has 45 stores. That number is expected to be slashed to just 12. Sally Barry is here now, and Sally, it was a calm and cooler start to the weekend. Yeah, it certainly was, Ange. Temperatures felt milder under those cloudy skies today with light winds and little in the way of rain. But across the north of the country, we are watching the start of a tropical cyclone form off the Northern Territory. It's a very slow-moving system. It is set to bring hundreds of millimetres of rain, though, right across the north. It's expected to intensify into a Category 2 cyclone as it just moves towards the Gulf Coast. It'll affect Queensland, too, which will be their first cyclone 
cyclone of the season. Tomorrow, inland parts of New South Wales are also set to see some good rain, including areas around Burke. While in Sydney, we have calm skies tonight, with temperatures just sitting around 22 degrees on the coast and also in our west. And I'll have Sydney's seven-day forecast a little later, Ange. OK, see you soon. Thanks, Sal. The jury in the Harvey Weinstein rape trial deadlocked. Next, what they asked the judge that could change everything. Plus, wild brawl, a man stabbed as violence spills onto a street on the central coast. Dramatic pictures from inside a burning building the moment hero officers risk their lives. Royals know more why Harry and Meghan have been forced into a major rebrand. And soon in sport, the bunnies up. too Your good part. for the eels in an entertaining contest at Wentworthville. A man has been stabbed in the neck during a violent early morning brawl on the central coast. A group of men was fighting in the middle of the road at Woywood when the 33-year-old was attacked. He was treated uh, immediately by the ambulance crews and he did lose a significant amount of blood. That group of males was involved in a confrontation of sorts. He remains in hospital in a serious condition. There's been a surprise development in the Harvey Weinstein rape trial. After days of deliberating, jurors say they've reached a verdict on some of the charges, but they remain deadlocked on the most serious allegations that could see the disgraced producer jailed for life. For a fourth day, Harvey Weinstein arrived to learn his fate. Are you ready for the verdict today, Mr Weinstein? Good morning. Today, that jury revealed it may have reached a partial verdict, but it's deadlocked on the most serious counts of predatory sexual assault, which could put the disgraced movie mogul behind bars for life. They'll have to continue deliberating and see. The judge said he wouldn't accept a partial verdict. The jury will have to keep working at it next week to decide if they believe the women's assault claims and whether Weinstein is a serial predator. Mr Weinstein, are you worried the jury thinks you're guilty on some of the charges? Whatever the verdict turns out to be, it won't be the end of it for Harvey Weinstein. There are still several lawsuits brought by accusers that are still pending. And there are also new charges of rape and sexual assault waiting for him in Los Angeles. In London, Prince Andrew had this waiting for him outside Buckingham Palace. An American school bus urging him to tell the FBI what he knows about former friend Jeffrey Epstein's sex crimes. The work of Gloria Allred, who also represents several of Epstein's accusers. Will you be letting up? No. I'm known for persistence. Andrew denies knowing a woman who says she was forced to have sex with him at Epstein's home. He needs to set an example, not just for this case, but for any other case. If you have information that's relevant to law enforcement or any criminal case, please provide it. In New York, Paul Kadak, 7 News. Police have raced into a burning building in the US to free residents trapped inside. Incredible body camera video captured the dramatic rescue as officers braved flames and thick smoke to save lives. Is there anybody in here? Come down now. Get down. Come on. Get out. Come on. Crawl forward. More than a dozen people were injured, including five officers. They're all expected to make a full recovery. Harry and Meghan have confirmed they will give up their Sussex royal branding. After weeks of talks with aides and senior royals, including the Queen, the couple agreed to drop the word royal from March onwards. It means their new website will have to change and their charity, set to be unveiled in the coming months, will no longer be called Sussex Royal Foundation. It's been 24 hours of contrasting fortunes for our men's and women's cricket teams. Jim Wilson is here. Jim, an extraordinary performance in South Africa. Yeah, it was wonderful to watch, Ange. Good evening to you, evening everyone. Our men's team crushed the Proteas in Johannesburg in their T20 series opener. And Ashton Agar was simply brilliant. He took five wickets, including a hat-trick, to rip through the South African lineup. Highlights very soon in sport. But it was a night to forget for our women's team in their World Cup opener. Also ahead, the Bunnies and the Eels take centre stage at Ringrose Park at Wentworthville. We'll bring you some of the action shortly in sport. And Wonderland buzzing as Western Sydney stay in the finals hunt in the A-League. The big moments from Bankwest Stadium very soon. Also some Olympics news on the road to Tokyo. Not far away. Good stuff. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks, Ange.
This summer has left many New South Wales towns drying out and desperate. Next, how you can help local businesses get back on their feet. Plus, the multi-million dollar fraud ring selling designer shoes and bags. The major breakthrough that could bring the space race into the Aussie outback. And unbreakable bond, how French students are sending a message of mateship to Australian bushfire victims. That's next. A woman has been charged over a multi-million dollar fraud and money laundering syndicate targeting the Thai community in New South Wales. Detectives have been investigating the scam since 2018. Yesterday, they raided properties in South Strathfield. More than a dozen designer shoes and handbags were seized, along with mobile phones and other devices. Police say the 27-year-old woman used social media to advertise inflated rates for exchanging money. As we near the end of a horror summer, there's a fresh appeal to help towns ravaged by drought and bushfires. Businesses across all industries need our support to stimulate local economies and get communities back on their feet. Regional winemakers ravaged by bushfires and drought, vineyards burnt, grapes tainted by smoke. 2020 is our fourth drought affected vintage. By the time we pick it, because it hasn't filled out much with these dry conditions, is going to be probably half of what we would normally get. The regions need visitors to come sample spend. Sydney's International Convention Centre now lending a hand, showcasing some of the best drops in a new docu-series and on their wine list, which is now all local offerings. To have that as a showcase for our state industry is invaluable. There's no time like the present to be out there giving them that amount of extra support. But the struggle extends across industries. On the state's south coast, local businesses are crying out for help. In Batemans Bay, Dixie Shaffron lost her house in the fires and now her surf shop is struggling. Everybody would, was trying to help us out by sending food and clothing, but it's totally the wrong thing. If you can't visit to shop locally, there is another option. They buy a voucher within the town, so that helps the business, and then they give it to the person that needs it, and it's all kept in the community. Every box of wheat bix or you know, bag of fruit that I bring into one of these towns is something not bought in one of these towns. Organisation Give It is leading the way, buying vouchers for fire-impacted community groups from fire-impacted businesses. We're just going in, and we're not doing much, we're just putting a little bit of money through the till. A small act that can make all the difference. Amber Laidler, 7 News. Australia has the land and the technology to reach new heights in our quest to enter the space race. Now we're one step closer to orbit. Scientists have launched our first international rocket from humble outback Queensland. The start of a race beyond Earth. From a paddock at Funny Farm Space near Gundawindi, a rocket spiralled into the sky at 1,600 kilometres an hour. In 30 seconds, it reached the highest point of the flight. Australia's first international sounding rocket launch a success. From start to finish it was uh, flawless. Capable of going beyond 15,000 metres, it returned to Earth a few minutes later. There is a GPS payload on it so we can track it. The three metre long rocket was built in the UK, launched here, part of a space campaign between the two nations. We were able to observe the descent of the vehicle as well just, just meant that the recovery time is shortened. The industry is worth $400 trillion in America. Australia is the perfect launch pad. Our landmass stability, the right ingredients for space technology. We're probably the only suitable country in the southern hemisphere. Eventually, rockets leaving here could yep. send satellites up to monitor our beaches, fires, the weather. Space industry, I, I think, is a, a, a far... Uh, uh, broader part of our life than most people under understand. To get up there, you need to be able to launch um, rockets. This is proof we can. Jessica Mummy, 7 News. More than a century since World War I, Australia remains firmly in the hearts of people in northern France, especially new generations. At one primary school, the kids are focused on bushfire relief and sending messages of support. 
At the Cobbers Primary School in Fromel, Australia is quite clearly part of the curriculum, our military ties, culture and our animals. It's s'appelle Diary of a Wombat. It's their favourite book, so when images like this appeared on French TV, the kids wanted to help. Someone is riding a bike and the koala was very thirsty and children were very upset because they say we know that koala don't drink a lot, so if we need water, that's, he, has a very, he is in danger. They began fundraising for a wombat sanctuary, sewing joey pouches and making cards for the students of Clifton Creek Primary, the tiny century-old school in East Gippsland built before the Great War, destroyed in the fires. The people of this town consider the bond with our country as unbreakable. More than 5,500 Australian soldiers became casualties during the Battle of Fromel in July 1916, men who hailed from all parts of the country. Like Private William Reed Fitton, buried here, born in Clifton Creek. It was a sort of sign from uh, the sky, from God. They gave their lives, they made the supreme sacrifice, and we want to say thank you to the descendant. That's why, in addition to their bushfire efforts, the kids of Fromel have been visiting the graves of Aussie diggers. Six-year-old Celeste received her backpack as a thank you. It's the parents of my soldiers. Et c'est qui ton soldat? Alfred Deck. A symbol of enduring mateship worn with pride. In Fromel, France, Sarah Greenolch, 7 News. A man has met the hero Faris who went above and beyond to save his life during a heart attack. Next, a heartwarming reunion and the team effort in catastrophic conditions. Plus, major makeover, the multi-million dollar plan to spruce up Chatswood Chase. A popular suite pulled from the shelves over contamination fears. And the weather is warming up again, the seven-day forecast, soon. There's an urgent recall for several brands of a popular lolly over contamination fears. The recall covers Jersey Caramels made by Lolly Co, Fine Time and Big Lolly with a best before date of November 2020. It's feared the sweets could contain plastic. The products are sold at IGA supermarkets and independent stores across the country and should be returned for a refund. Major plans have been approved to transform the ageing Chatswood Chase shopping centre on Sydney's North Shore. The $327 million expansion includes a new cinema, car park, health and fitness centre and extended trading hours. The massive redevelopment is expected to take 30 months to complete, but some residents have voiced concerns about traffic and construction noise. An 82-year-old man who suffered a heart attack on one of the state's most catastrophic fire days has been reunited with the team who saved him. Thanks to quick-thinking firefighters who were in the area, he survived to tell the story. As fire roared towards his Barara community, the blind and mostly immobile Bob Butler was seeking shelter in a neighbour's home when his heart gave way. His wife Carol thought his time was up. Saw me go away in the helicopter and gave me a kiss on the forehead and thought that was the last time she was going to see me alive. He had suffered uh, a, a massive heart attack. His heart was, really wasn't beating, it wasn't beating properly at all. But thanks to the RFS, who happened to be on his street at the time, Bob's luck quickly changed. They immediately began CPR and defibrillation. Then off-duty nurse Mandy came to his aid. Paramedics arrived shortly after, all before a care flight helicopter landed and rushed him to hospital. Just went from one to another to another to another and I think I got the rub of the green going right through sort of thing. The survival was, was exceptional. Today, Bob got the chance to thank them all. We fight fires to, to help the community, but an opportunity to actually uh, save someone's life and see him again is just fantastic. I was lucky right through from the time the, the first bloke started working on me because he just happened to be there and at the right time, you know. Carol now has her husband back in full health and life is back to normal. I'd have to sell me a little car because it's in his name. <laughs> Tom Saker, 7 News. The Palace of Versailles is undergoing a decades-long renovation. Once the scene of kings, peace treaties and revolution, now a renovation project. A glimpse into a world of riches from centuries gone by. Don't miss that story soon on 7 News. 
That's Jim's back with Stuart. And Jim, it's trial time in the NRL. Oh, bring on the league for 2020, Ange. Good evening again to you, evening everyone. Coming up, the Eels and Rabbitohs continue their build up to the season with a Friday night trial at Wentworthville. Highlights next. Plus, hat trick heaven. Ashton Agar spins Australia to victory against South Africa. And the 20 year old Aussie super heavyweight who's out to make history at the Tokyo Olympics. Welcome back, everyone. Ashton and Agar start with bat and ball, including a stunning hat-trick to help Australia to a crushing win over South Africa in Johannesburg. Agar was named player of the match and finished with five wickets in the 2020 series opener. A moment of history for Ashton Agar. Got him! That's him! Gone! Ashton Agar with a hat-trick for Australia. Jubilation as the off-spinner became just the second Aussie to claim a T20 international hat-trick behind Brett Lee. It feels great. Um, I'm sort of a bit lost for words, really. Three wickets in his first over ripped the heart out of South Africa's run chase. The off-spinner finished with five for 24, the best T20 figures by an Aussie. Earlier, David Warner lasted just two deliveries against Dale Steyn. Steve Smith's innings began with a false start. Well, Smith's going to get booed for that. I think the umpire has signalled dead ball rather than four. Smith top scored with 45 as Australia posted 196 batting first before Mitchell Stark made a mess of the Proteus skipper. Oh, that is an absolute beauty. That is a sensational delivery. A commanding 107 run win, the perfect way to silence the South African crowd. To be fair, we've been treated incredibly well. Um, this whole week, so hopefully, hopefully that continues for the rest of the tour. Back home, the pressure has voluntarily ramped up on the Aussie women's team after a disastrous start to their T20 World Cup. Straight away! What a delivery! The Aussie run chase crumbled, mesmerised by pint-sized Indian leg spinner Poonam Yadav. Australia now must win all three of their remaining group games to ensure a spot in the semi-finals. It's a knockout tournament. We probably started that a little bit earlier than we would have liked, but uh, there's pressure on at World Cups all the time, and, and these games coming up are no different. Andrew McCormack, 7 News. South Sydney got the better of Parramatta, 28 points to 24 in their pre-season trial game at Ring Rose Park at Wentworthville last night. Jack Johns, the son of former NRL star Matthew, crossed for his first try in Rabbitohs colours before veteran Michael Jennings hit back for the Eels with one of his own. Tom Burgess's second half try was enough to seal the win for the Bunnings. Yes, So it is Tom Burgess. Takes the old-fashioned route, hard, fast load of the ground, and the Rabbitohs have four more to the score... There was more reason to celebrate in the Johns household today with Matty's other son, Cooper, scoring in the Storm's 18-16 win over the Warriors. Beautiful pass. That's superb from Brinko Lee. And Cooper Johns is in to score. Well done to the Johns family now. It's All-Stars not on the Gold Coast. And the Indigenous women and Maori women are locked at 4 all approaching full time. The Western Sydney Wanderers kept their A-League finals hopes alive with a wild 5-2 win over Adelaide at Bankwest Stadium last night. Trailing 2-1 after 22 minutes, Nikolai Muller brought the Wanderers level before Mitch Duke put them in front for good. Adelaide open again. Duke! Oh, what a goal! What a finish from Mitch Duke who scores for the third game in a row. Duke's second saw Western Sydney score four goals and a half for the first time in their history. The win moves the Wanderers into seventh, four points outside the top six. They've been on-air colleagues and then went to rival networks, but our very own Bruce McAvaney and Eddie Maguire are set to join forces again for one night only. The duo will host the AFL State of Origin bushfire charity match side by side on Friday evening. I know the cause is so worthy that it's been a great response from all the best players, but I've got a feeling it might be the start of something. Well done to Bruce and Ed. Now it's the first time the pair have worked together since 1995. The match will be live and free on the screens of Seven. Can't wait. The first race of the supercar season has just finished on the streets of Adelaide. Red Bull driver Jamie Wincup started on pole and got the jump on defending champion Scott McLaughlin. Opted to pit early to stay out of trouble. James Courtney's race ended on lap 18. Scott, oh, he's in. Courtney. He tried to follow Heimgarten up. He ran wide. He got into the grey and he hit the fence hard. McLaughlin's early stop helped him move up in a second, but out in front, no one could keep pace with Wincup, who cruised to a comfortable victory. 
Gay Waterhouse has her sights set on a seventh golden slipper after Farnan upstaged heavy favourite Celsa Beale in the silver slipper at Rose Hill Gardens this afternoon. Farnan is off and gone from Global Quest. Great go for third. Fayara's running a big race, but Farnan's going to win easily. Star jockey Shuey Bowman guiding the two-year-old Colt perfectly to book a spot in the Golden Slipper on March 21. You'll see that on seven. Tagaloa held off favourite Hansi Attic to take out the $1.5 million Blue Diamond Stakes at Caulfield. Well, Australians who've won Olympic boxing medals, you can count them literally on one hand. But there are astute judges of the sweet science who believe this year in Tokyo, that will all change. Meet Justice Hooney, only 20, and he's imposing. 193 centimetres, 113 kilos. That helps when his job is to intimidate. When I'm confident and I'm, and I'm ready to go, like, I, feel, I feel like I'm unstoppable. He'll need to be. The world's fourth-ranked amateur super heavyweights got Olympic qualifiers in Jordan next month. And there's a couple of tough guys from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan plotting an ambush. This is my chance, this is my opportunity to prove myself. Self-belief isn't a problem. As an eight-year-old, he had a blunt message for Dad. He hopped out of the ring and he, out of the blue he said, Dad, I'm going to become a world champion one day. That faith has never wavered. This kid is self-driven. There's a certain place he wants to get to and there's nothing that's going to stop him. I think this kid has the X factor that could make him the next greatest sensation in boxing in two or three years' time. Uh, I'm just chasing dreams. Serious dream chasers leave no stone unturned. Three rounds, five minutes. Finish called. Body's always sore, especially at the end of the week. <laughs> the body's gone through some pains. His only flaw? Dad's convinced Justice is a midnight fridge raider craving chocolate. Innocent. Innocent. That'll probably be my nephew. <laughs> Unbeaten in five years, pundits believe Justice could be Australia's next Olympic boxing medalist. He joined an elite group. Since 1908, Aussies have only won five medals. Spike Cheney was the last, with silver in 88. Obviously, gold is the goal. Even if he medals, I'm still going to be over the moon. It'll be an awesome feeling. And the rest of the country. Pat Welch, seven years. Good luck, Justice. It all starts on July 24. Now, talking about Tokyo, Tasmanian Daniel Watkins is set to realise a dream and compete at his first Olympic Games. Watkins provisionally secured his spot in the C1 men's for Tokyo by topping Paddle Australia's selection rankings. Now, dual Olympic medalist Jess Fox claimed gold in the women's kayak on the first day of finals at the Australian Open canoe slalom. Jess, who won silver in London, bronze in Rio. Hopefully she can go to the gold in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, Sydney Track Classic tonight, a huge night of track and field at Sydney Olympic Park. I'll be talking everything Olympics and sport on sunrise in the morning. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks, Ange. Once the home of French kings and the infamous Marie Antoinette, the Palace of Versailles outside Paris is in the middle of a decades-long renovation. Costing nearly a billion dollars, it could be a never-ending job ensuring that French and Australian visitors can take a peek into a world of riches long gone. The French call it Chateau de Versailles, but this is hardly just the chateau. It is a palace dripping in gold, the scene of peace treaties and revolution. Versailles is a sort of symbol for all the French people. French style, history, power and fashion. Is it any wonder Louis XVI's queen, Marie Antoinette, said of the starving masses, let them eat cake. These were her royal apartments and after two years of renovations, they've reopened to the public. The bed itself is a symbol that everybody loves to see and then probably fantasies of um, more than any other room. She formally went to bed here, but privately Marie Antoinette's life was behind the restored tapestry. These apartments still bare after the palace was plundered in 1793. You can feel the history, you can, you can feel the ghost, the presence of the ghost of Marie Antoinette here. This room for the Queen's morning private time will soon be restored to its former glory, like the rest of the palace in the midst of a decades-long renovation. The current project, the Chapel Royal, once the scene of French royal weddings, its exterior under wraps. Right now, it's a haunting mess of half-completed sculptures, statues on the roof now trapped in scaffolding as master craftsmen restore the originals from moulds taken of rapidly decaying stone. We have to respect their work. It is hard to emulate the dream of the original sculptor. 
It'll take three years to complete the work in the chapel, including replacing the rafters. To help, they've built a workshop in the roof. The opulent days of absolute monarchy are, of course, over here in France. In fact, they ended here. And in the 21st century, the French government is reducing the amount of money it gives to this place. So it's being left to wealthy benefactors and private companies to donate to ensure this palace survives. You can adopt a tree or sponsor a masterpiece. It's so big that when you're finished with one part, I mean, the, the part that was finished 60 years ago begins to suffer. So it's, you know, it's really never ending. A renovation project for the ages. In Versailles, France, Hugh Whitfeld, 7 News. Firefighters and their families have enjoyed a well-deserved day out at the Silver Slipper Race Day at Rose Hill Gardens. Among them, the widows of Jeff Keaton and Andrew O'Dwyer, the heroes killed by a falling tree while fighting bushfires at Buxton. It's nice to have a, a day just to enjoy the day together, I guess. More than 100 RFS volunteers and their families attended. And Sally's back now. And Sal, have we seen the last of the wild summer storms? <laughs> well, we do have some more storms forecast next week, and I'll tell you what to expect with the seven-day forecast next. You're paying money on loans for nothing. Over $15,000. The costly charges they must pay you back. 7 News, Monday. Tonight's 7 News headlines, Australia's coronavirus travel ban has been relaxed to allow students stuck in China to return. Police are hunting a hit-run driver after a father was killed on his morning walk on the northern beaches. An elderly woman has managed to escape as fire engulfed her Eastwood home. And David Jones has announced it will close many of its suburban stores. Now here's Sally with Sydney's weather. Thank you, Ange. Well, it was a mild start to the weekend, but Sydney could see a few more storms fire up, although they're not expected to be severe like we saw this week. Today, a little bit cloudy, and that stopped us from getting too warm in the city. We reached a top of 24 degrees after a low this morning of 19, which was reached at 8.30. This is how the day panned out across the suburbs today. We had tops of 24 degrees along the coast at Manly, 22 degrees at Badgeries, and a little bit cooler at Katoomba. 15 was the maximum today. Now, from the satellite, we are watching a monsoon trough and a tropical low across the north. That's expected to intensify into a cyclone overnight, which will be Queensland's first cyclone this season. Tomorrow that system will possibly be named Esther if it forms and it will spread widespread showers and storms right across the Gulf. While a trough in the east will also tap into that moisture and that's going to trigger some really heavy showers and storms across parts of Queensland, just in those inland areas, and also across northern parts of New South Wales with some good falls expected. Around the capitals tomorrow, Brisbane can expect a shower or two and a top of 27 degrees. Canberra will be partly cloudy, a top of 28 degrees, or so partly cloudy in Melbourne tomorrow with a top of 31. Hobart touch of sun, 24, 32 degrees in Adelaide and lots of sunshine and some showers and storms in Perth tomorrow with a top of 33 degrees. Around the state, mostly fine skies are expected along the coast, including for Newcastle tomorrow, 27 degrees the top there. It'll be 28 degrees at Batemans Bay. It'll be raining though at the back of Burt. We're expecting some really good falls possibly over the next 24 to 48 hours. Tops of 25 degrees there with showers and storms forecast. Now, across Sydney tomorrow, we can expect to see fairly cloudy skies for most. 24 degrees will be the top of the lot for Manly and also at Bondi. It'll be a touch warmer just away from that sea breeze, though, heading for a top of 26 degrees at Parramatta and also Blacktown. And the highest chance of showers will be in the west tomorrow rather than the east. On the coast, south westerly winds will gust up to 30 knots, while in the city tomorrow we can expect a partly cloudy day. We're heading for a top of 25 degrees. Looking to the further ahead outlook, and we can expect a top of 28 degrees on Monday and Tuesday. Might just see a shower or two on Wednesday with possibly a storm expected. Only around three millimetres in the gators. So, guys, nothing too much at this stage. OK, thanks so much, Sal. And that is 7 News for this Saturday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening and Weekend Sunrise is from 7am. Stay with us now for the replay of 7's Firefight Australia concert. I'm Angela Cox from all of us here. Thanks so much for your company. Have a great night.